good evening everybody welcome back to the new edition of uh, the diva pani post graduate lecture series uh, today we have with us dr nachiketa desai a young dynamic psychiatrist who is rising on the academic horizon quite fast and uh, we are happy to have young blood to take proceedings forward we also have with us dr nikhil chaudhary he is a psychiatrist from kolhapur I uh, had the good fortune to know his father and uh, he is a well respected psychiatrist at Kolhapur and uh, as is often the case uh, the lineage is carrying being carried forward quite ably with uh, Dr Nikhil he is a consultant psychiatrist at Swastik Hospital and neuro psychiatric center at Kolhapur presently he has been a former associate professor of the department of psychiatry at Diva Patel Medical College Kolhapur He is the president of Kolhapur Psychiatric Association. He is the former secretary of the Deccan Psychiatric Association. Association, and uh, he is also a principal investigator in a number of drug trials. He is young, dynamic, eager to learn, and also eager to teach, as as has has been his role in the recent past. So I will hand over the proceedings to Nikhil, and I will step back in towards the end of the program. over to you nikhil okay. thank you so much sir thank you so much for your kind introduction at the outset actually i would like to thank uh, the organizers for giving me this opportunity and uh, platform to uh, uh, be over here uh, so today's uh, topic is behavioral addiction as you all know behavioral addiction uh, has become a glo- global problem over the period of last one decade and recent uh, data shows that there is a significant rise uh, in the prevalence of behavioral addictions the overall prevalence of behavioral addictions these days uh, the data shows uh, that it is as high as 11% and it has become a potential uh, health issue now uh, you all know that there are various types of behavioral addictions like uh, internet addiction addiction gaming social media food addiction sex addiction exercise addiction etc uh, now uh, behavioral addiction uh, lies on the border between uh, compulsivity and impulsivity so uh, there are a lot of challenges uh, in day to day practice uh, Uh, in the diagnosis of the these patients uh, evaluating these patients so it uh, was uh, what's happening guys it is mute your mom mic Can you mute everybody else, please? I'll request the administrator to kindly mute everybody else. So to understand, no, I muted everyone. So to understand better, it's neurobiology, the biopsychosocial model, the clinical symptoms or the presentation, diagnostic uh, challenges, the treatment modalities. Uh, today we have esteemed speaker uh, Nachiketa, who will deliver his talk uh, on uh, behavioral addiction. So, to introduce um, Nachiketa, uh, Dr. Nachiketa Desai has completed his DPM in two thousand fifteen from Civil Hospital and B J Medical College, Ahmedabad. he has worked as a government psychiatrist at daman in 2015-16 he is a visiting psychiatrist at various hospitals in navsari gujarat and has his own clinic since 2018 his main areas of interest are personality neurobiology of psychiatric disorders and its treatment modalities 
and he also aims for better understanding of neuroscience of psychiatry and how it can be translated from bench to bedside. So with this introduction, I hand over uh, to Dr. Nachiketa uh, to deliver his lecture. Dr. Nachiketa, please. Hello, everyone. Am I audible? Yes, yes. Are the slides visible? Yeah. Okay, fine. So first of all, I would like to thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity and a nice introduction by our Dr. Nikhil Chokule, sir. As sir has already set the ground, we are now going to talk about behavioral addictions and the issues and controversies surrounding this particular topic in psychiatry. So, to start with, I'll give a case as a context. This is based on a real case. Mr. Zed's 25-year-old male patient presented with wife and reported the excessive mobile phone use. On elaboration, he was playing Teen Patti game, which his favorite actor recommended, Sarukh Khan. Initially, he started playing when depressed or bored. He won some money and then he started playing regularly. And gradually, his duration, amount of money spent increased to the point of exclusion of other activities. He would also report no joy or thrill in playing smaller amount nowadays. He has to bet big in three digits or four digits, which has led to debt in lakhs of rupees. And if he does not get to play, he would present with restlessness, irritability, and sometimes even anger outburst. We'll try to understand the theoretical background and how it translates clinically in this particular case. So what is addiction? Addiction has been defined differently by multiple different organizations and uh, I would say researchers. But simplest way to understand is maladaptive overuse of pleasurable or distress relieving substance or activity. Maladaptive because it can be leading to social occupational impairment or affecting health. Sussman and Sussman gave saline points for any addiction. The first one would be existence of subjective appetitive need, be it need for thrill or excitement or relief from distress. Then there would be repetitive attempts of satiation of that need through engagement in specific behaviors or substance. That leads to achievement of those specific effects or satiation. Preoccupation with this uh, uh, obtaining these effects via the associated behavior, even when not actively engaged in the activity, loss of control over time spent engaged in this particular behavior and undesired or negative consequences resulting from continued engagement in this behavior. Same Sussman also suggested three possible subjective experiences of satiation. It can be related to engaging in behavior that makes one feel better, like in our case. It can be related to optimal level of arousal, feeling energetic, wakeful, and other things. Or it can be related to optimal level of thought activity. That is, a person want to engage in exploratory thinking or quiet down the overwhelming thoughts. However, the cessation of need via this substance or behavior is at times illusory and gradually becomes maladaptive. At that point, we call it addiction. Coming to behavioral addiction, Mark Griffith proposed six main components of behavioral addiction. One would be salience. The behavior becomes most important activity and tends to dominate the thinking, feeling, and behavior to the exclusion of other activities at times. Mood modification, that is the arousing rush or numbing or tranquilizing or calming escape it provides. This is related to the satiation experience of arousal or thought activity. There would be tolerance, 
in terms of increasing duration or escalation of intensity, reckless behavior, destructive person describe this as ego dystonic. I don't want to do this, but I have to. Visual symptoms, just like substance addiction, but most of the times it is related to feeling states and associated physical changes like irritability, tremor, anger, outburst. It also leads to conflicts in interpersonal relationships, in intrapsychic conflicts as various dilemmas or subjective feelings of loss of control and conflicting with schedule and other activities. Last one is relapse. That is a person tries to stop that but ultimately returns back to this activity or substance. So how does behavioral addiction compare and contrast with substance addictions? The same reward system is involved Tolerance is described, the stages of addiction cycle like pre activation anticipation, then binging, and then visual symptoms are also applicable. And there are some similarities in treatment modalities. However, in case of behavioral addiction, it is related to a particular behavior rather than a substance. And that's why that particular behavior may not have specific neurobiological effect like in case of substance where we know that alcohol, opioid and other substances have different specific effects on brain. This lack of substance-specific pathophysiological changes, however, does not mean that there are no changes. There are common pathways and one way of thinking about that is the same pathways involved in substance addiction also. So there may be a component of behavioral aspect in substance addiction also. Physical withdrawal symptoms are less common because of the lack of specific neurobiological effect like substance. And there are differences in treatment. For example, certain treatment modalities are not as well suited in behavioral addiction as they are in substance addiction. However, just like we mentioned just now, the co-occurrence of behavioral addiction and substance use disorder is common. It can range from 20 to 70 percent in various different studies and uh, different disorders that are described. Now, they have described pathological gambling, leptomania, skin picking, compulsive sexual behavior, internet addiction, compulsive buying. And some of us may be wondering that some of these names are actually not described in addiction. They are described as beat, impulse control disorder, or other areas. Then why are they listed as behavioral addiction? This is an important point and would probably be a recurrent point throughout the presentation about the blurred boundaries between normal, abnormal and between two abnormals. So the proponents of behavioral addiction propose that same addiction cycle as shown in this graphic is also applicable to behavioral addictions. However, there are differences of opinion. These are the proposed types or subtypes. But do they actually merit separate naming? And do these addictive behaviors stay same across lifetime or culture or demographic? Whether to call it addiction or not, where is the line? We'll try to understand that. So common features across behavioral addictions are Access indulgence in activity, loss of control, negative consequences, with Hello. Hello. Nachiket, I think so you have some network issues. Uh, I have connected. It probably got disconnected. Is it visible now? Yeah, yeah. Yes, you can go ahead. Yeah, so I think we were with common features across behavioral addictions. Was this the last point or I should I go back one or two slides? One slide back. Oh. Addiction cycle. Yeah, so the same cycle has been proposed to play a role underlying the behavioral addictions also. 
by proponents of behavioral addiction. But this is some debate and controversy regarding this, whether the same cycle applies to behavioral addiction as substance addictions. And there are various subtypes proposed like gambling, sex addiction, internet addiction, video gaming, shopping, food, work. But do these behavioral addictions really merit separate naming? And do these addictive behaviors stay same across time or culture or demographics? And whether to call them addiction or not? Where is the line? Let's try to understand that. So common features across behavioral addictions are excessive indulgence in said activity, loss of control, negative consequences, withdrawal symptoms, and underlying traits. First four points are almost same as the points covered in Marx 2005 criteria. And the other commonality that has been seen in various studies, for example, this is a representative study that says that there are common biomarkers in all behavioral addictions that are not specific to one activity or addiction. So what this neurobiology Hello, am I audible? Yes, you are audible. Yeah, okay. Is the volume fine? Yeah, volume is okay, but I think so. It's slightly... Okay, yeah, I'll, okay, I'll okay. Make it fine. So, neurobiologically, the commonest we start understanding is with neurotransmitters, be it dopamine, that is neurotransmitter word. Then slowly we try to understand other systems like both glutamatergic neurons, serotonergic, norepinephrineergic. So the dopaminergic one is the reward part, we all know. The stimulus leads to release of dopamine, which leads to pleasure and reward. Then the basal ganglia parts get involved, incentive salience is attributed. Through the principles of conditioning and reinforcement, the behavior gets repeated. So dopamine is not just limited to to a particular stimulus, whether it is important, whether it is pleasurable, whether it is noxious, but by and large related to pleasurable and positive informant. So, how does this relate to addiction? Low levels of dopamines have been linked to addiction, particularly low tonic levels. And then there are pulses when there is uh, the stimulation of circuit. Those low anhedonic tone or low tonic levels of dopamine have also been called reward deficiency syndromes. These are practically same things with different names. Glutamate, as we know, main excitatory neurotransmitter, basolateral amygdala and medial prefrontal cortex are two areas of which glutamate is implicated in context of addictions because of its or close correlation and interaction with the reward pathways and extended learning pathways. High levels of glutamate have been linked to addiction. It can produce agitated state. What are the other systems? Endocannabinoid, endopioid, stress hormones are also involved, particularly CRF. Corticotropin releasing factor has been considered an important part of dysphoric state or uncomfortable state produced after the substance high is over. This is also described as anti-reward system. This is related to food and Volko model of substance addiction. And this is the whole picture where different players interact with each other, be it basolateral amygdala glutamate or on top right, the glutamate of ventromedial prefrontal cortex there is hypothalamic opioid peptide. Various substances act on various parts of this whole interplay. And ultimately leads to the common features of any addiction, be it substance or behavioral addiction. This is the another way to describe the same thing. When there is a stimulation in form of environmental stimuli, the serotonin neurons via 5C2 receptor affect opioid peptide neurons, which can either block the GABA neurons or activate cannabinoid neurons, which indirectly again leads to disinhibition of GABA neurons. 
ultimately it strongly blocks glutamate neurons, the neurons we talked about just now, which in turn acts on dopaminergic neurons. There is the role of acetylcholinergic neurons also, and ultimately dopamine is released in nucleus accumbens. This is how different players come together. But as it was mentioned in introduction, there is a role of impulsivity and compulsivity in all this. Where does this fit in this picture? So the first thing to understand is impulsivity and compulsivity are both multifaceted constructs. They are not monolithic. Impulsivity has characteristics of maladaptive predisposition towards rapid reactions. There is reduced response inhibition. There is automatic response to allergies or impulses. Many times patients describe that they are thinking after acting. They realize very late. There is delayed aversion, insensitivity to delayed rewards. And these are the features studied in various research articles. As to compulsivity, it is persistent or pervasive behavior that is inappropriate to situation and has no obvious relationship to an overall goal. They are repetitive in nature and unpleasant and performed in habitual or stereotyped way. Older concept was that this impulsivity and compulsivity lie on same spectrum defined by perseverance. If there is low perseverance, it is towards impulsivity and person keeps dropping things and typical ADHD type of presentation we can say. Whereas if there is high perseverance, more than required, person will not be able to stop doing one thing. But as research progressed, people understood that this is too simplistic and it is not always right because there are many conditions where impulsive and compulsive, both features are available in same person to varying degree at different times, be it impulsive spectrum of inadequate control, disinhibition, risk-taking behavior, or compulsive and characterized by harm avoidance, risk aversion. So, are they actually two different dimensions which are correlated? It seems so as of now, because of the simultaneous presence of both types of behavior. And the proportion of those behaviors can vary. Sometimes impulsive behaviors are more prominent. Sometimes compulsive ones are more prominent. In context of addiction, earlier the impulsivity plays more part. Inability to resist the urges and repeated exposure, which leads to the high end kick, which leads to positive enforcement. And over a period of time, this learning the positive reinforcement and other associated mechanisms, they become overtrained and ultimately develop compulsive habits. That is very common and characteristic hallmark of any addiction. At a later stage, they are compulsive behaviors rather than impulsive indulgences. So in neurobiological terms, there is a definite shift in control over responding from prefrontal cortical area, that is the response inhibition and impulsivity related thing to striatal control and this transition is clinically noticeable as transition from voluntary action in substance abuse to more habitual or compulsive modes and proponents of behavioral addiction say that this element is also present in behavioral addiction so in terms of learning it is moving away from positive reinforcement motivated by reward seeking towards negative reinforcement focused at avoiding distress and to talk about neurobioanatomical areas, some have described ventral sidereal activity in context of impulsivity and in context of compulsivity. But nowadays we understand that no brain part functions in isolation. There are various connections, structural as well as functional, and it's quite in-depth topic to go in today. So, the original question, are there two different dimensions? Yes, there are orthogonal factors across a range of disorders and either construct may be present to a greater or lesser degree independent of the other. 
this is one schematic representation showing what we have discussed so far. As we can see, the impulsivity part has again small subcircuits related to reward, related to reward conditioning, the amygdala. This part is related to incentive alliance. Hippocampus is involved for memory. There are cognitive circuits, response inhibition circuits. And there is a gradual shift from impulsivity to compulsivity as the neurobiology or neuroprogression of any addiction takes place. This progressiveness of addiction will again come into picture when we discuss recent differences of opinion at the end of the presentation. So, to summarize, there are background traits of low hedonic tone. There are other traits like impulsivity, attention deficit traits, leads to reduced prefrontal control, we can say, and there is emotional dysregulation. Somehow by experimentation or person get that typical high or rush or relief from distress leading to repeated indulgences that is positive reinforcement. Incentive server lines kicks in. So the stimuli that was not significant before now become significant and act as a cue to induce that craving for engaging in the behavior or substance again. Later, compulsive aspects take over and it is primarily aimed at avoiding negative mood states rather than getting the pleasure or high. So, either a person engages in it to get the reward or to flee the misery. That can be shown in a simplistic way in this schematic. So, the, the point that we discussed, no brain area separately acts in one function. There are circuits and each area has connections to other area and they are affected be it midbrain to basal ganglia to cortical structures and up to prefrontal cortex. And when there is dysfunction of any of one of the component circuits, it can affect and it usually does affect other circuits also. There are compensatory changes in this and that and a system failing to compensate or regain the balance or homeostasis we can say. That is the crux of any, I would say, neurobiological pathology, even beyond addiction. However, these changes don't just happen in addiction. People have tried to conceptualize even OCD as that compulsive phase of addiction. Uh, there is an overlap with impulse control disorders, as we discussed, kleptomania, pyromania, compulsive behaviors, eating disorders, these don't seem to have any clear boundaries. We do talk of phenomenological differences, but at neurobiological level, same constructs seem to be involved in varying proportion in all of these. And because of that, over a period of time, the same activity does not stay the focus of so-called behavioral addictions. It can keep on changing. Whereas in case of substance addictions, we see that there are people stable on one particular substance, stable in the sense that they are sticking to one particular substance for a long period of time. And there we see that typical progression from impulsive thrill-seeking use to gradually towards habitual and compulsive use with visual features. That brings to the question of normal and abnormal. Which activity do we consider as addiction? Any excessive activity won't be labeled or other should not be labeled addiction. Is smartphone addiction a reality? Because way back when there were no gadgets, people first started reading novels. There was a concern about novel addiction also. Person reading novel excessively to the exclusion of other activities. Then came TVs, radio, other technologies. With each technological generation, the core concern remains same, access indulgence in that activity. Only that the object or the technology changed. So, how to conceptualize 
behavioral addictions without pathologizing common behaviors. Daniel et al. has beautifully described and discussed these things, although Griffith has provided a counterpoint in 2017. But it is an interesting article to the, the link is described at the last slide. And this concern is very genuine because we are working on operationalized definitions for all psychiatric disorders. Operationalized being you are trying to measure or quantify something that is usually not quantifiable or measurable. Let's say diabetes, blood sugar, a cutoff is a quantification or operationalized criteria. Similarly, what do we do in psychiatry, specifically DSM or ICD? Well, is the symptom, the severity criteria, the frequency, maybe duration criteria, this many days, and then criterion BCD that no other pathology is explaining this, but it is all phenomenological or symptom level discussion. Pathology is not described in DSM. And most of the times that also runs on consensus guidelines. If 10 people agree that this should be called addiction, should it really be called addiction? That is the main debate in context of pathologizing the normal or trying to demarcate normal and abnormal in context of behavioral addiction. Any excess activity should not be labeled as behavioral addiction just because it is excessive. So, because we don't have single diagnostic test, we usually rely on scales, assessment of symptoms and history. We should be aware of that limitation that we are just describing group of symptoms. And then we have to see the context what are the other aspects that can help us decide whether it is normal or abnormal? And one common finding that is seen in these cases is that most of the times behavioral addictions have mood or anxiety disorders or personality traits or substance use as comorbid disorder. That can be one clinical hint. As to DSM and ICD, DSM only includes gambling disorder and considers internet gaming disorder as a condition for further research. It has not included any other behavioral addiction because they don't have data to substantiate their separate existence. Similarly, ICD-11, gambling disorder and gaming disorder. But the interesting part is ICD describes gambling disorder as impulse control disorder, not behavioral addiction. Similarly, Problematic internet use is not included in ICD as well due to lack of scientific evidence. How there is a trans diagnostic approach. The common relatable example is let's say CBT case formulation or psychoanalytic case formulation where we move beyond DSM and ICD. We should also avoid reinventing the wheel. We should not give 10 different names to one condition, let's say the low hedonic tone and reward deficiency syndrome. They may be practically the same thing. Why give two names? And then we should look at longitudinally lifespan. Then we can find stable behavioral traits and endophenotypes. And then the different age and the different physiology at different ages and different circumstances and this and that, they change or modify the presentation, but core traits and features will stay same. A person with attention deficit rate will have hyperactivity or will not have, or plus it would have this inattention part, impulsivity part. Even when those people grow up to become adults, there would be that attentional issue and impulsivity part which may variably be labeled as cluster B traits, specifically in terms of emotional dysregulation. And then this also indirectly is supported by the fact that many of the substance addiction patients do have comorbid ADHD diagnosis. As to treatment, we are not still not sure of the diagnosis. So obviously there are still no FDA approved guidelines or treatments for these disorders. 
even all principles of substance addictions don't apply. But treating them as impulse control disorder or compulsive behaviors does seem to work as evident by, say, eating disorders. It can be easily conceptualized as uh, food addiction, although some have tried to differentiate food addiction from binge eating and the eating disorders. Treatment options, as usual, therapy, medicines, other changes, treatment of comorbidities, that becomes more relevant in such uh, this uh, behavioral addictions. Because comorbidity also takes care of the so-called behavioral addiction. Still, what are the literature-backed uh, treatment options? Pharmacologically, naltrexone and nalgmifen two have been tried. Limited studies. Those, particularly naltrexone, those is slightly higher than what we use in substance use. And acetylcysteine has been tried. It works on glutamate and thereby seems to be helping. Antidepressants, mixed result, sertraline, fluoxamine, bupropion have been tried. Some support that. Some say no much difference from placebo. Lithium in comorbid bipolar disorder cases did seem to take care of associated so-called behavioral addiction issues when person went into remission for mood episode. Olanzapine was tried, not much different from placebo. For compulsive buying, fluoxamine studies were done, no much difference. Citalopram does improve in one study. So, first of all, the overarching theme is there are very less studies and very little evidence to conclude confidently either ways that this medication works or not. But still, in this particular slide, we can see that compulsive behavior, kleptomania, compulsive sexual behavior, these are usually treated as impulse control or compulsive spectrum issues like kleptomania is almost similarly conceptualized as trichotillomania and other things. That is the fuzzy inter-disorder or inter-diagnostic boundary. Specifically regarding compulsive sexual behavior, that one particular study, that there was only one study published till 2016. But I have my reservations about this study because it involved gay and bisexual people who had pornographic views and they wanted relief from that and that ego dystonicity may have to do with difficulty accepting that orientation. So I won't consider this study very openly or confidently. But it did show that citalopram helped. But even then, the authors, John Grant, in their article also cautioned that stopping one particular behavior may lead to catching on another behavior. So we have to be watchful for that, just like in OCD. When we remove one ritual, we have to look for substitution. Something like that in this case. Non-pharmacologically, stimulus control is aimed at compulsive behaviors. Aversive approaches have been tried variably. Imaginal desensitization has been tried in gambling disorders. Motivational enhancement may work. That's why Miller and Rolnik named their whole model as trans-theoretical model of change rather than de-addiction or addiction model. Then groups like Gamblers Anonymous or Overeaters Anonymous or a number of things. They are ultimately modeled on Alcoholic Anonymous, but they will have their limitations. And that brings us to the controversy. The diagnosis itself, whether to call it impulse control disorder, whether they are compulsivity phenomena, whether impulsivity and compulsivity same factor. As of now, it looks like orthogonal factors. And each excessive behavior is not an addiction. Each behavior does not need separate things. And some famous terms that we see in pop culture, let's say internet addiction, addicted to internet. Internet is a tool on which people do hundreds of different activities. 
that's like saying a person who is using alcohol is addicted to glass or bottle. So in future, we have to consider how to conceptualize that. It may be conceptualized something like specific phobia, where we have a one common diagnostic uh, criteria and there are two or three known subtypes. Then all those different uh, phobias do get different names based on the object of phobia. But still it is single diagnosis, specific phobia, this, this, this. We should look at compulsive spectrum disorders, DSM-5 has that whole category of and related symptoms and how it overlaps with behavioral addictions. And rather than phenomenological hair splitting, we can try and look at underlying neurobiology and how common substrates play different roles but significant ones in different presentations. This part is not new. It has been done in other contexts also. So for example, there is component model that tries to do something like this. It devises different components like uh, compulsivity and various others and try to address each component and tries to say that different addictions, particularly different behavioral addictions are variable combination of these components. Clinically, what we have seen is treating them as any other compulsive or impulsive disorder seems to help. And treat them with the molecules that can target the traits. For example, a person has underlying ADD traits. Taking care of the, those attention deficit traits will improve emotional regulation, will reduce the risk for substance use, will reduce risk for so-called behavioral addictions also, something like that. So what are the common underlying points that can be derived from longitudinal history? Coming back to Mr. Z, our original case, what did he have? He played game. Was it gaming disorder? The game was gambling. Was it gambling disorder? It was played online. Was it internet addiction? It was played on a phone. Was it mobile addiction? What would you name it? Or would you rather simply say a compulsive, maladaptive, overuse of a process or behavior that was serving as self-medication or self-treatment for those negative mood states? Ultimately, he got better with atomoxetine and deslavandafixin. He was advised complete avoidance of that particular game, that is complete abstinence as we see in substance. He was allowed to play other games, but without involving money. That is harm reduction approach. And that was deprioritized. He has to do other activities and everything. And when he is free, he can play this. This part was variably successful, but when there was another structure in form of activity scheduling, he could manage, which also required some elements of motivational enhancement. And as of now, that person has improvement in this problematic online gambling game related behavior, improved mood, improved impulse control, and family is happy. And patient himself is satisfied and now looking forward to recouping those lakhs of rupees loss and that he has incurred. To conclude, diagnostic category of behavioral addiction is still debatable, yet these are the problem behaviors we see clinically and they need treatment. In some cases, accidents may be possible, but not always. Say for example, food addiction or eating addiction, we cannot say stop eating completely. When the underlying impulsive compulsive issues are taken care of, it most of the times uh, helps in this behavioral or process addictions also. So far, literature says there is effect of antidepressants, naltrexone, even nalmifen, ADHD meds, they are likely to help. And they may be indicated for the this is the list of the references included and in particular this one, the Daniel et al. Second from last. 
that article is relevant to keep in mind to not pathologize the normal. Thank you. Yes. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Nichiketa, for your lucid presentation. Uh, first of all, uh, you have nicely uh, elaborated on various aspects of behavioral addictions, right? From its, you know, the six components of behavioral addictions, similarities and differences of uh, uh, behavioral addiction and substance use disorder, the addiction cycle the various behavioral addictions, the neurobiology of behavioral addiction, that is uh, very uh, lucid information regarding the neurotransmitters which are involved in uh, behavioral addictions, as well as various uh, 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 cycles which are, uh, you know, involved uh, in behavioral addictions. At the same time, uh, you nicely covered uh, the diagnostic challenges uh, in terms of there are limitations of DSM-5 and ICD-11 uh, while diagnosing behavioral addictions. And uh, at the end, uh, the case study which uh, uh, you have uh, mentioned, uh, now it has got a very interesting uh, point that at the end you mentioned that whether it you call it as a behavioral addiction, if so, what type of behavioral addiction how, what to name and uh, ultimately uh, you have mentioned that maybe it might be a, a compulsive maladaptive behavior. So uh, overall I think so we have uh, uh, narrated very nicely. So we have uh, questions over here. I request all the participants to uh, write their questions in the chat box so that it will be uh, easier for us to take uh, questions one by one. Uh, that is first. Uh, so we have a couple of questions. Uh, I think so. Uh, there's one question by Dr. Nupur. Yeah, second. Yeah, I can see the question. And I'm just getting back to the case with you. Correct. So, yes. Uh, Dr. Nupur, to answer your question, this is what we see clinically. We always don't have complete history on first interview. And this is the summary of whole multiple settings. But yes, patient did display impulsivity. Patient had concentration or attentional issues. He would get distracted easily because he was roughly 25, 26 year of age. He did not have prominent hyperactivity, but he was impulsive, moody, easily distracted, lost in thoughts, would report that thoughts are wandering in his head and he would have trouble focusing on one thing. Those things prompted me to explore the childhood part of the behavior. And this feature seems to be stable across whatever life history I could get. And those pointed me towards possible underlying attentional and ADD traits, which prompted me to start atomoxetine. I started it at 18 milligram and increased it to 36 milligram. And because patient is stable now, I have not increased it further. Okay, there is another question. Yes. Which, yes. which is related yes, to treatment itself. Uh, that mm -hmm. is, again, why desphenylaphexin was, uh, you know, chosen in the treatment of this patient. So, desphenylaphexin is an SNR. So far, we understand these antidepressants in terms of their neurotransmitter actions. But we need to move beyond just neurotransmitter actions. These things, be it SSRI, be it SNRI, they do a lot of things at intracellular level and the cascade it triggers. In this particular case, because the initial few weeks or initial few days of action, is related to neurotransmitter action, be it noradrenergic or dopaminergic, whatever. It was a clinical judgment call that uh, noradrenergic and dopaminergic boost may slightly may 
help initiate the recovery slightly faster. It may be a difference of say five ten days, not much. But yes, fluoxetine may be equally suited. A patient did not have prominent agitation at that point of time, so if it was there, I would have used the sedating agent like maybe fluoxamine. Yes, uh, just to uh, uh, you know, uh, not add to this, but uh, I have one question regarding uh, this case itself. That uh, whenever we plan uh, any treatment, psychopharmacological treatment for these patients with behavioral addictions, uh, how do you uh, you know proceed with the diagnostic uh, uh, you know formulation and uh, you know, or how did you assist the patient? What psychometric assessment uh, uh, you do uh, in such patients that's the first question second question do you assess the uh, psychiatric comorbidity uh, maybe anxiety disorder depression bipolar disorder or any other psychiatric disorder in such patients uh, so that it becomes again convenient for us to you know select molecule or the treatment of line in uh, these patients so in this in this case uh, what psychometric assessment uh, you have done? Have you ev uh, uh, evaluated or have you assessed his personality uh, before initiating treatment? So, what is your take? Question. Uh, what What is your take on personality assessment in behavioral addiction patients? So, on the whole, I would just first mention my approach how I assess the patients. It is ninety nine percent of time clinical yes. because I practice in a city where psychometry is not commonly done or at times there are affordability issues with the kind of patient I see. But I do believe that a thorough history can compensate for those psychometry. And what I do is I focus more on longitudinal history right from, if possible, antenatal period which is not always possible, but I try to go as back as I can in childhood. And from there, I start tracing what are the features and where, where is that deviation in uh, trajectory. In Like in terms of the uh, pediatric growth charts we used to see. It was 5 to 95% earlier, something like that. A person may not fall outside of that but still have a deviant trajectory that he was in upper quartile and then slowly shifted to lower. This part would require formal measurement, but clinically you can get an idea as to how that person has grown and evolved. It would suggest certain features and traits. For example, this impulsivity, the diagnostic conundrum comes there, whether to call it, so it is definitely trait impulsivity and there is some amount of trait mood liability. On top of that, he would have state impulse control issue and state mood issues, which he did have depression and acting out. But whether to call it cluster B personality or whether to be, whether to consider it associated with the underlying ADD traits, again, it may be related to reinvention of will. But what I saw was a person who is quick to react, impulsive, has lower hedonic tone in terms of getting bored easily, not getting enjoyment in normal, natural stimuli that easily, like food, comedy shows. And then something came which gave him that thrill and rush and he felt good. And this is common across all substance use disorders also. That gap between that hedonic low tone and that peak is what makes that particular stimulus very appealing, be it a substance or an activity. So this is how I try to conceptualize clays. It is largely based on clinical history and those same ADHD features and emotional regulation is one common core construct of common personality disorders we see clinically. So yeah, it may be conceptualized as cluster B. Ultimately, we are working on emotional regulation. 
be it cluster B or ADD related. Okay. There are a couple of other questions that why atomoxifen not methylphenidate? Uh, largely because of schedule X status. Uh, to be very frank, otherwise I would have preferred MPH. There is an availability issue. There is only one medical store who has that schedule X license and sometimes it's not available. And the trickiest part is when a person has responded and then there is availability issue. So. Okay. So now one more question is regarding uh, uh, the comorbidity, uh, psychiatric comorbidity as well. So uh, comorbidity in behavioral addiction as well as substance dependence. So uh, how would you consider uh, this aspect of comorbidity uh, with behavioral addiction? So the way I look at it is DSM actually diagnosis that we use nowadays because of lack of other alternatives. They are groups of symptoms, symptomatic description, just like we used to describe high grade fever with rigors. There can be different causes. So, in a given patient, if I am observing him longitudinally, which is very rare, person has to be followed for years, I can maybe make out certain things, but in absence of that, the history I get, I try to find commonalities, common constructs. And those common constructs are the targets of intervention. They will have different clinical presentations or phenotypes at different time. That is what we see as poor longitudinal stability of DSM ICD diagnosis. But those components that led to that presentation, be it impulsivity, compulsivity, the traits we describe, they are always there. Why not target them? And when it comes to the diagnosis of personality disorder, usually we have that slight counter transparent that this is personality disorder, it's not going to go away. Fine. Diabetes also does not go away. We manage it. So why not manage these traits? It's not as pessimistic if we have realistic expectations. Improved impulse control, some sense of stability in life. This is quite common. I have three or four patients who would have been variably diagnosed as borderline personality or dependent personality. The way I looked at it, I saw adult ADSD gave them some advices and they looked up online Vendor Utah ADSD scale. This is a self-report scale, freely available. They applied it and the score made cut off. Now whether I would look at it the same way as I would look at malaria positive or WBC 12,000. Maybe not. I would look at it as indicative of some pathology because there's a lot of sub, uh, subjectivity going on. The scale has been standardized for certain normative data which may not match our population, but it can be a rough estimate. So when I approach patients like this, many times I don't even put diagnostic label. I say this symptoms are present. Anxiety symptoms, depressive symptoms, and say addiction symptoms. Why are they present? Most of the time, they are person's own flawed ways of managing those other issues, the self-medication model that we see commonly. And then helping them deal those things in a healthier way at times takes care of all the so-called comorbid presentations. Okay, all right. Uh, now, extension of, uh, I think so, the, the beginning part of uh, this question was by Dr. Ashwin, do you think that doses used in the treatment studies were adequate to elicit a response? Yeah, that is a major limitation. First of all, how would we decide what is adequate dose? When the construct itself is in question, we say compulsive buying disorder, but it is not there in ICD or DSM. What to do? We say work addiction or workaholic. 
not an official diagnostic criteria what to do so first limitation is that dsm icd are symptom lists and they have heterogeneity in population so they all want to respond to same medicine same way on top of that we are not even agreeing on the operationalized criteria that becomes challenging and so those doses used in those studies are what either was already going on for comorbid condition or what the researcher felt is okay and adequate that is major limitation It's one question by Dr. Rahul. Can you see that? Uh, yeah. Uh, shall we consider small uh, dose of consider... or benzodiazepines for the management of agitated behavior? It can be considered, but the, uh, again, agitated behavior is like fever. There are types of fevers. Like there are types of agitated behavior. If it is, let's say, manic agitation, it would require manic anti-manic treatment. But for impulsive outburst, that amygdala hyperactivity is more relevant. That requires low doses. And low doses like say risperidone 0 0.5, haloperidol 0 0.5. And then we have other options also. Let's say would clonazepam help at that dose 0.5 mg or 0.25 mg? It would. Clinically, I have seen it help. So, for me, what I have seen clinically, forgetting all other aspects, clonazepam 0.25 is not just anxiety. It helps in all excited states, even anger. But the key part is, because it provides quick relief, it has potential to become addiction. Already having the addiction diathesis. Same goes for ketamine, I think. Somewhere somebody asked for ketamine. Yeah, there is one ketamine. question about ketamine as well. Yeah, yeah. So the ketamine is euphoria. It could immediately provide that uh, pleasure or relief. That is how it helps in suicidal ideation and treatment resistant depression. And that is why most of the times it affects veins of. So uh, other way to conceptualize is would you give alcohol addiction patient? Uh, something like lunazepam for indefinite use. It has potential to lead to same addiction because both act on GABA. So that part we have to keep in mind. At the same time, let's say a person is agitated. In substances, we broadly see two categories, uppers and downers. Those who are down prefer upper. Those who are up or agitated prefer downers. So an agitated person may not tolerate ketamine very well. Okay, there's one more question on uh, what about uh, the use of low dose diabel for it? Uh, specifically for anxiety part, it has been a second line treatment for quite some time. I am not sure, but something like a serum level of 50 is considered for that anxiolytic part. So it can be used. Valproate has been, uh, has good evidence base in aggression, impulsivity, and along the same lines, Carbamazepine has slightly more literature in impulsive outbursts, particularly in prison population and those having antisocial traits. But logically, it should help. Only point I would remind is the low is very subjective. Low for one person may not be low for the other person. It may be either ineffective or high. There are personal variations. So clinically, we'll have to see, let's say, for example, divalprox. Uh, at a very crude level, it slows down nerve conduction. So if dose is too high, it can lead to slowed down mental or brain activity, which can present as cognitive features or depressive symptoms. That means that we have to lower the dose. If somebody is having that at 500, I would give it 250. If somebody is having at 250, which is there, but can happen in geriatric in other contexts, some when Let's say it's used for agitation in dementia. I have secondhand heard somebody mention 125 milligram divalprox in geriatric population, which on paper sounds very odd, but what for that particular patient? 
Okay. Uh, I was wondering that there uh, all the questions were on psychopharmacology, but Dr. Nupur has raised a concern, which actually I was thinking to ask you regarding the psycho uh, psychotherapy intervention in uh, this patient, sure. and as well as role of uh, psychoeducation. Mm -hmm. Second thing, uh, how would you uh, you know prevent relapses in such patients? So these are the two questions in extension to uh, Dr. Nupu's question. So first thing, psychoeducation is paramount, crucial. Even if you forget counseling or psychotherapy, never forget psychoeducation. That would include explaining the pathology, what is happening, why is happening, why you are struggling. And additionally, side by side, see, in real session, what happens is there are different threads interconnected and running in parallel. So while I'm explaining this, I'm also explaining the family that partly it is out of patient's control. And at the same time, I'm also drawing patient's attention that this is not giving you a free pass. Just like a hyperglycemia in diabetes is not a person's fault, but all healthy behaviors, taking medicines regularly is a person's responsibility if he wants healthy life. That kind of balance needs to be achieved. This is one thing which I explain to both relatives and patients. And then little element from here, little element from there, which is very conveniently called eclectic therapy. But what is actually meant by eclectic? In its truest sense, it means taking one theoretical model of one psychotherapy, which seems to be missing out on certain features, which are then can be addressed with another school of thought. And those elements are included with that and combined with logic. It's not random. Then there comes points of non-specific response. All medicines have placebo response. Similarly, therapy also has that, which we call healing or non-specific response. That covers listening to patient, validation, common sense counseling, these things go on. Other specific techniques as and when time permits, for example, if I'm looking at five stages, pre-contemplation to contemplation, this patient already presented in contemplative state. So things became easier. He had some amount of motivation to quit. Initially, it was due to external factor key, family members stopped nagging him and the financial burden. But slowly he understood that, okay, I came for one problem behavior, but it goes beyond one behavior. I'll have to keep a watch at other aspect also. Say, for example, stopping this should not lead to, say, buying addiction or exercise addiction. Although we commonly see, especially in addiction context, many people subjectively report, the day I started exercising, I forgot other addictions. But was it healthy exercise? Or was it exercise addiction in form of process addiction? And again, where to draw that line between passion and addiction? Only one clear line that I see is passions are somewhat socioculturally approved. And those which are socially culturally not approved and detrimental to health and these things, they are labeled behavioral addiction. For example, a workaholic person works 16 hours a day has hypothymic temperament, impulsivity, risk-taking behavior, starts five branches of his job. Phenomenologically, it has similarity. But socioculturally, it is acceptable. It, he is very hardworking. What to do? So, yeah, these elements can be considered psychotherapy, but there were no formal sessions. It was as needed basis more oriented on problem solving and emotion management. Yeah. Fair enough. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, are there any other questions? Yes, there's one by Dr. Ritwik. Is uh, uh, process addiction uh, bad each time. For example, can going to the gym repeatedly be considered a positive response since they are not hurting anyone else 
and so excess and also exercising. So that's a theme. The blurred boundary between passion and addiction. Person maybe say in a competitive sports, be it gym, be it bodybuilding, be it a number of things. Those competitive sports at top level need excessive indulgence in that particular activity. We don't call it addiction. We it, Because it is necessary to stay on top. So, yes. What can we do? We can keep common sense in mind. If it is hurting, stop it, reduce it. If it's not, it's not maladaptive in any sense, socio-occupational, financial, health-wise, anyways. Let it be. But do keep an eye. The moment it turns maladaptive, we have to stop. Yes. All right. Are there any other questions? Uh, I'm trying to check. Uh, I don't see any. There are if I miss some. Okay. So, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Nachiketa. So, uh, what I have understood uh, so far from your presentation was, and even after the question answer uh, session, that whenever a patient comes with a uh, behavioral addiction, what initially uh, we need is to take a detailed history. We have to uh, reach to a tentative, you know, a diagnosis. While giving diagnosis, the comorbid diagnosis has to be considered. Personality uh, element has to be uh, assessed. Uh, and at the same time, the treatment modalities, let it be pharmacological management and non-pharmacological management. And at the same time, we need to psychoeducate uh, the relatives because uh, in a clinical practice, actually, it's really tough to uh, explain uh, to the relatives that this is a disorder and he she needs treatment. So I think so. Uh, with this, uh, I would like to thank Dr. Nishiketa uh, again for his... I forgot to mention one thing. Apologies for that. The thing about relax, yes. I missed that in the discussion. I'll just briefly mention it. Even the addiction societies of the world have described that addiction is a chronic relapsing remitting disorder. Relapse will happen. We can work on preventing it and more importantly, work on the management of that without being judgmental to person. Just like we would manage a recurrent hyperglycemia case in diabetes. Fair. Thank you so much. Over to you, sir, Dr. Ashwin, sir. Great. Very nice topic and even more enthusiastic discussion. And uh, when any topic uh, stimulates so much of discussion, one thing is very clear that uh, the talk was an excellent one. And uh, the topic is controversial enough and perhaps not adequately explored enough for everybody to want to discuss it more at length and understand it more. So I think we set the ball rolling and Nachiketa will hopefully take it forward on multiple forums. This is an area which we all see on a daily basis, but we haven't yet addressed it. Unfortunately, we are stuck with the neurological uh, classification system rather than the phenomenology of the disorder. And I think that's where we need to relook at this because it's far more rampant and far more common than our textbooks might suggest. So I think uh, it, it was a good opportunity for us to have Nachiketa uh, teach us a little bit about it. And uh, again, Nikhil did an excellent job of taking the proceedings forward. So thank you once again, Dr. Nachiketa and Dr. Nikhil for taking the time out and uh, gracing us on this uh, platform. And of course, all the enthusiastic participants who not only were a, a, a very, very attentive audience, but also quite astute uh, question uh, posing audience as well. So thank you very much for all of you to be on our platform today.
and uh, we promise to keep bringing you interesting topics uh, going forward and hope to have you back in big numbers and of course uh, thank you sanfama for the unflinching support and uh, we hope to see you again next month for another exciting topic thank you thank you all once again and have a great evening ahead thank you sir thank, thank you, you sir